All right, let's who's, see who's joining us tonight. Welcome, everyone. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, this is part two of the VLAP workshop 2021. Um, our aquatic invasive species refresher is tonight. And if you registered for this part two, then you also registered for the June 14th refresher for the cyanobacteria. Just going to give a couple more minutes so maybe um, some more people want to join. They can. <clears throat> All right. So, again, welcome to our part two of the 2021 refresher. Uh, Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so just a bit of housekeeping tonight. You are all muted uh, and your webcams will not be shared. So you can do whatever you want. You can catch some of the Bruins while we're listening um, and just have a good night and kick back and relax. This session is being recorded um, and it will be available at a later date on the VLAP webpage um, and the VLAP YouTube page um, where the other uh, presentations have already been posted. If you have a comment or questions, you can use the chat box in your control panel. So the chat box is right here. You type your message here, hit send. Uh, let's see, if you have any trouble with your audio, you can expand this button. Um, you can use your computer computer audio or you can call in if you call in for audio just make sure that you enter your four digit pin number which would have been sent to you upon registration um, so we're going to hold questions really until the end and let Amy answer those then um, you'll also you should receive a follow-up email it likely won't be until after the second session of this, this part so after the cyanobacteria workshop on June 14th. Okay, so tonight uh, we have Amy Smagula here and she is going to present to you our aquatic invasive species refresher and I'm going to hand things over to Amy. I think I can just grab it, Sarah. Let me know okay. if it pops Perfect. up. Do you see my slides? I, yes, I do. Okay, great. All right. Uh, it looks like, I don't know, Sarah, if it was you freezing or me freezing, but just in case, I am going to turn off my webcam so that I don't take up too much bandwidth, so hopefully the screen doesn't freeze at all. And uh, welcome everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you are getting either a nice breeze from your lake or that you are sitting inside air conditioning this evening. It is pretty warm out. Um, so as Sarah said, I'm going to go through a refresher for the aquatic invasive species that many of you are concerned about. And as we go through, I'm going to uh, first start off with some news and updates for you since it's been a while since we've chatted, um, a couple years since the last VLAP refresher. So I'm going to, to give you some uh, news that 
is interesting <laughs> based on current times and covering a lot of hot topics that have come up lately. I'm going to talk about the state of aquatic invasive species updates in the state and then I will go through and give you a refresher on aquatic plants and animals. And then I'm also going to just go over the state's approach at aquatic invasive species um, management in general, just so that I might be able to pass along some things and ideas that other groups are doing that you guys may be interested in. So these are the updates, sort of the hot news, if you will. Uh, I'm going to talk about the 2020-2021 drought. Um, I'm going to talk about a new plan of concern that I just found uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, some eDNA updates, which is some pretty neat science. I'm going to talk about hydrilla, which is one of the plants that I've been talking about for years that I'm really afraid is coming to New Hampshire. I don't think we have it in the state yet, but I do have an update for other states nearby that do have it. And then for those of you who have divers that are working on any aquatic invasive plants in your water bodies, we do have a new weed control diver instructor, and I will convey that information to you. So a lot of times we get questions about what is the drought doing to aquatic invasive species in our water bodies? Um, I know there are lots of concerns about drought with lake level, well levels, groundwater levels, water quality, but drought does also affect aquatic invasive species. And it does so in a number of ways. Um, when we have long, hot, dry summers, we do tend to have a lot of transient boaters and lake visitors when it's hot and dry, and that could potentially increase the risk of spread. The more people you have moving around and visiting water bodies, the increased likelihood is that they will bring something with them that will find a new home in your water body. So that is certainly a concern. Uh, lower water levels due to, draw, to drought can lead to invasive species growing deeper. So if you think about it, your water levels are down, sunlight is able to penetrate to different parts of the lake bottom where it ordinarily wouldn't have. So you might have light extending out deeper or farther offshore. So milfoil or fanwort or some other type of aquatic invasive plant can creep deeper into your water body and gain a foothold. And many of these plants get, are pretty tall growers so they can reach the surface and get sunlight uh, when the lake level is back up uh, just fine. So that is another risk. Uh, another thing that we need to think about, and this is for both plants and animals, is lower water tends to be warmer. There is less water there, so it heats up faster. And that can potentially make uh, these more tropical species, the species that like warmer water, uh, happier. So if they are introduced, they might get a foothold and they might do well, and then they might be able to adapt strategies for when water levels are back up and at more normal temperatures. So a couple things there. And then from the land, what you may see is that nearshore species may actually creep onto the lake bed. So around the edges of your lakes, you may notice that some areas that are usually wet are dry during a drought. So some of the terrestrial species may gain a foothold in what they, what they think is new terrestrial habitat. Um, the good news about that is that once the water levels are back up, those species won't hang on very long and they will ultimately disappear because they don't really like wet feet. They're just taking advantage of temporarily exposed sediment. So then um, environmental DNA or eDNA, this is uh, an interesting science. There are two efforts going on in New Hampshire. Uh, that I'll talk about. But first, eDNA is um, basically looking for the, the DNA signature of a species in water. So the goal is to be able to develop a method where we can just simply take a water sample from your lake and test it for different species and see if they're present or absent. Uh, so two specific projects that we've got going on, uh, New Hampshire is partnering with a number of states in the New England region, and we're looking at 
two animals, zebra mussel and Asian clam populations, trying to dial in tests where we can do just a laboratory analysis and see if either one of those species is there. And then the other thing is that DES specifically is partnering with UNH on three species, and those are hydrilla, the Chinese mystery snail, and the spiny water flea for presence absence detection. So this is sort of the new wave of the future to make analysis easier and quicker. And certainly we still need all of our weed watchers and volunteers keeping eyes on the water, but this is sort of like a second check. Um, either way, volunteers can second check the data because there could be false positives or eDNA could potentially um, second check biologists and volunteers doing surveys uh, just to make sure we're not missing anything. So that is pretty exciting. Um, we're still doing field and laboratory work for that. So the actual lab analysis portion is a couple years away, but we are laying the groundwork for that now. And this is something that's happening on a lot of fronts, uh, not just invasive species and aquatics, but eDNA is being used for a number of species because uh, it ultimately could be quick and easy. And then the next update is uh, this plant. So I was out surveying on Lake Winnipesaukee a couple weeks ago, and I was in a cove that I survey a couple times every year uh, for, for many years, and I saw this plant and I had never seen this before. And I, I've seen a lot of plants in New Hampshire and beyond. Uh, this is Hotonia palustris. Um, it doesn't really have a great common name that I can share. Um, I can tell you that Hotonia is a, is a genus of plants that uh, doesn't have a lot of different species or types of it. Um, we do have one Hotonia in New Hampshire that's actually endangered. Uh, it's Hotonia inflata, and I actually just had a report of it today on the Powwow River, and it's very, very rare to find the other species of this. Um, this particular one is not native to the United States. Uh, it is actually native to Europe and Asia, and it's a popular plant in the home water garden trade and in the aquarium trade because it has this very lush, bright green foliage. Um, so when I found it, it was very abundant in a cove off from Winnipesaukee covering about 50% of the cove. The cove's about 20 acres, so there's about 10 acres of this plant in the cove. Uh, and then I looked at another cove and there were two individual plants in that cove. So the two coves are on opposite sides of Pagas Bay from each other. So it was alarming to actually see this plant and then find it in a second location. So I checked in with our Natural Heritage Bureau and um, a couple of the regional botanists who, who wrote the textbooks on botany in the Northeast, and we verified the species. And we realized that this is only the third occurrence of this in the United States. So that is not good news. It's not a good species that we are actually welcoming. Uh, it can be quite invasive. And as I said, Suddenly we had 10 acres of this and not having previously documented it in the system uh, where I was surveying. So I just wanted to alert everyone about this one and just keep an eye out. If it's in one water body, it could be in another. I suspect somebody had a home water garden and it was released from that. The problem is that it does produce seed and it can spread by fragmentation. So it can spread pretty quickly. Um, so. The interesting thing about this, those of you who are familiar with milfoil, it does look a lot like milfoil underwater. It has feather-like leaves that are whirled around the main stem, uh, but it's much bigger than any milfoils we have. It's a very large plant. Um, this is probably several inches across, like five inches across. Um, and then this time of year, it's sending up these little stalks with little purple flowers on it. Um, so this is just one to look out for. If you see anything like this, let me know. Natural Heritage has deemed this an invasive, so it's not a state-listed plant yet, but it's one that we definitely don't want, and we'll, we will be doing management on this species. So just, just an FYI, this one is in New Hampshire, and we definitely don't want it to spread. Uh, a note about hydrilla. 
So we don't have hydrilla yet in New Hampshire. This is a really high risk plant. And I'll show you more pictures of this when I do the plant refresher. But these are some photos from Connecticut. And you can see this is a marina on the left and it's very dense growth all across the marina. So easily chopped up and spread. Um, in the middle picture, you can see just very dense growth. And then on the right-hand side, um, what looks like a tidal river is not. This is a, a normal reach of the Connecticut River in Connecticut. And that is hydrilla that's closing off the channel. And that's just a deeper channel up the middle that boats have been using for navigation. So it's very quickly spreading. Um, hydrilla has been documented, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Massachusetts, Southern Massachusetts and Agawam, where Six Flags is located, just on the river, right next to Six Flags, is the first leading edge of this population. So there's a little bit in Massachusetts. And then this river section here is down through Connecticut. And all these little dots that you see on this map are locations where hydrilla has been verified. Um, so it's pretty much throughout Connecticut at this point. Uh, so hydrilla is a very aggressive plant. It can spread by fragmentation, by tubers, by birds moving it around, boaters, um, and we're very concerned. Uh, in the last three years since we um, have started to get concerned about hydrilla and had an inkling of hydrilla in the southern half of the region, uh, several of us from Vermont and New Hampshire, you can see us on the boat here, have been surveying portions of the Connecticut River in, in between Vermont and New Hampshire, and we haven't found any hydrilla, but we are definitely monitoring for it. And the general risk of the hydrilla too is that boaters from Connecticut or Massachusetts could opt to come up to a lake or pond in New Hampshire and bring with them uh, unwanted gifts. So um, it's definitely a high watch species. It always has been, but even more so now, just due to the density in the river. Uh, and then finally, the other update is that the um, new weed control dive instructor is started. Ted Aldrich, for those of you who work with him, uh, was a longtime diver. He's retired from both teaching and contract diving. But luckily, Dave Coyle from Aquatic Specialties has taken on this role and he is teaching these classes. Um, so if anybody is interested, if you have an invasive species in your water body and you would like to learn to become a weed control diver, you can email Dave and set up a class. Um, you all, you do have to have an open water rec uh, certification at a minimum in order to become a weed control diver. But uh, there, are, there are a number of lakes across the state that volunteers are doing this and helping to remove invasives and they're really making a lot of progress. So it's gl I'm glad that we can continue this program. So moving on to what was the headline for this evening. Um, the state of the state of AIS in New Hampshire are aquatic invasive species in the state. Um, we do have a, a fairly steady number of water bodies that are infested. We really haven't added many water bodies in the last couple of years since I last gave an update to the VLAP group. Uh, so 91 infested water bodies, 11 rivers, and then most of the infestations are lakes or ponds. We did have a jump in the number of infestations. So these are the number of water bodies up top, but some water bodies have more than one thing. And we've added a couple new water bodies in recent years that were already infested, but I found something else in them too. Uh, most recently, I found uh, curly leaf pond weed in Otternick Pond just last week. So that one now has variable milfoil, fanwort, and curly leaf pondweed. So uh, the ringers are still the Connecticut River and the Nashua River, which have six different invasive species in them. But uh, most of our lakes just have one, thankfully. Uh, but there are some that do have multiple. Uh, and I just wanted to point this out to you. Many of you are aware of this. This is our DES Lake Mapper app. And uh, you can just simply Google DES, NHDES Lake Mapper. It will bring this up and you can zoom in and click on any water body. And then you will get this little dialog box and you can 
get your VLAP reports here. You can get lake assessment reports. You can also see what type of invasive species is in that water body and if they have a long-term management plan or other information available. So this is a, a good way to spy on your neighbor lakes and see if they have anything that is uh, <laughs> of concern nearby. So now the refresher. Uh, I'm going to take you through a variety of aquatic plants and animals. Many of you are familiar with these from past presentations, but it's always good to get these in front of you so that you can take a, a closer look at them. And I'm going to start right on shore, um, right around the edge of the lake, so that you get a good idea of the ones that you could see creeping along your shoreline. Purple loosestrife is one that in the last couple years I've noticed is making a comeback. We did have a very active biocontrol program in the state where beetles were released to munch on the leaves of these plants and eventually purple loosestrife populations decreased greatly. I think that between a couple years of drought, those beetle populations didn't do so well in the really dry conditions. Uh, so maybe they died off a bit and purple loosestrife was able to rebound. But last summer in 2020, I noticed a lot more purple loosestrife than I had in several years. So this one is making a comeback. And if you start to see this one popping up along your shorelines, it's a good idea to, to dig it out and get rid of it before it starts to spread. Uh, as soon as you get a mature plant, each of these can produce up to two and a half million seeds during a summer season and they can spread very quickly. So uh, as a refresher, purple loosestrife has leaves that are opposite or whorled around the main stem, and the stems are four-sided or squared. Uh, so those are some characteristics of the plant itself. And then of course, in usually July and August, they have these bright purple spikes that come up, um, usually along lake shores or along roadways, highway margins, places like that, and in wetlands, of course. The next one is common reed. And this one I have started to see become a little bit more aggressive in the last couple years. We have had several reports of this creeping into people's lakes. Um, so just keep an eye on that, especially if you have roads that are a little bit more developed around your water bodies and you have road salting activities. This plant likes salty, moist soils along lake edges. Um, and then once it gets established on shore, you can see it starts to creep into the water and gain a foothold there. And then it will just continue to creep outward, forming islands and peninsulas out into the water. The plants, these plants here, the young new plants are probably four feet tall. The really mature plants can get anywhere from 10 to 10 to 16 feet tall, so they are large and they start to, to tower over any of the low growing native vegetation, so they should be easy to see. And they have these big, almost silvery green uh, sword-like leaves on them. And those brown seed heads that you saw in this photo don't start to come out until usually end of August or into September. And then the still, even after a couple years, floating leaf plants pretty much just include the Phragmites, I'm sorry, not the Phragmites, the, the water chestnut right now. Uh, this one is in two locations in New Hampshire, uh, still in the Nashua River, and then it was in the Connecticut River for a while. We found another population of it in the, in the, in the Nashua, I'm sorry, in the Connecticut River down near um, Bellows Falls this past summer. So it is moving a little bit. Um, it's very different looking than the lily pads that it would typically mix in with. It has triangular shaped leaves that cluster almost in a, in a bouquet, if you will, or a rosette. And then it's anchored to the bottom. And then this part of the plant, unlike most of the plants that we worry about spreading by fragmentation, the water chestnut only spreads by seed. So this seed is one that can unfortunately last for 12 years and still potentially germinate. So if you do have any awareness of a potential water chestnut introduction, 
it's going to bear a good amount of monitoring to make sure that it doesn't germinate in your leak. And then we're trying to avoid this, which is very dense growth over the surface of the water body, literally choking out boat traffic and other recreational activities on the water body. This is gets super thick. And then the submergent invasive plants. So for these, almost every single one of them will spread by fragmentation. Some of them do produce seed. That is a problem in terms of persistence in the water body. So not only do you have to worry about controlling the plants, but you also have to play out the seed bank. But by and large, we really worry about these species being chopped up and spread. And of course, the variable milfoil, which is the one that we've long been concerned about in New Hampshire, uh, which is the most prevalent. This one uh, you can see has very dense growth. I've seen the diameter of this be uh, about an inch wide to about the diameter of a coffee can. So it can be quite variable in terms of how robust it is. Uh, it has these leaves that are whirled around the main stem. They're feather-like and the count of these doesn't really matter. It, it does tend to vary quite a bit. But anytime you see anything that looks as uh, robust as this, it could potentially be variable milfoil. And when it's starting to pioneer or come into your water body, uh, the, the tip is to look for something that looks like a squirrel's tail coming up off the bottom of your water body. Um, thick tubular growth, um, often forming a little cluster to start with, and then some of these taller plants that are shooting up a couple feet tall in the water body. This one will grow, I've seen it uh, usually eight to 10 feet tall, but it has the potential to be 10 or 15 feet tall. And of course it does get very dense in a water body. And then Eurasian water milfoil. So for those of you who live on the Western border of New Hampshire and then in the Southern portion of the state, Eurasian water milfoil is a potential for you. Um, the variable milfoil could be anywhere in the state based on our chemistry, but Eurasian water milfoil is a little bit more restricted in terms of its tolerance. So if you guys fall into the pH range of about seven or higher, you would probably more likely have Eurasian water milfoil. And if you're looking at your VLAP results and you see pHs of about six and a half or less, you're probably going to be variable milfoil. So those are the two distinctions and what you could expect to have based on your pH and your lakes. Um, so Eurasian water milfoil also has feather-like leaves that are whirled around the main stem, but you can see it's not quite so bushy, and that's because it has these gaps between the whorls of leaves. So this is classic. And the stem can either be pinkish or whitish, but these gaps are distinctive. And then the other really distinctive thing that you can count on with Eurasian water milfoil is if you count these little pairs of leaflets on the upper right here in uh, these little tiny leaves that come off the, the main leaf, if there are 12 or more pairings, then, you're, then it's definitely Eurasian water milfoil. That is a solid characteristic of this plant. And for those of you who are on lakes and ponds across the very southern border of New Hampshire, anywhere from probably oh, Derry over to the seacoast area along the southern tier, the fanwort is one of those plants that could be a high risk for you. We do have this in nine water bodies um, in Hudson, Derry, Atkinson, um, Hampstead area of the state. And it looks a lot like milfoil when you look at it underwater, but when you take it out of the water, you can see no feather-like leaves. These leaves are more splitting or branching, and they're opposite on the main stem. This one also tends to be a very bright green when you see it in the water. And you can see these opposite leaves are continuous all the way down the stem. This will grow typically eight to 12 feet tall in a water body. And it can get very abundant, just like the milfoils can, as you can see here. And then this little guy, uh, sorry, my wording is cut off at the top. This one is um, spiny naiad or brittle naiad. 
This one is one that we are starting to see pop up in a number of places in the state. Usually the water bodies that are browner in color, um, especially impounded river systems that are, that are made into lakes or just overall tea colored water. Um, the plants are small. They only grow about eight to 10 inches tall, not feet, definitely inches. And they're very spiny, as you can see from this little inset photo with the orange background. And the leaves are curled backwards. So they are uh, really distinctive from that standpoint. The brittle naiad name comes from the fact that the plants are in fact very brittle. And the good news about this one, unlike the other underwater plants, is that the leaves themselves and the stems themselves aren't the issue. So you could chop it up and that's not gonna grow. Unfortunately, it does produce seeds where the leaves connect to the stem. And if the plant is brittle at the point where the seeds are and that breaks off and floats, the seeds are gonna propagate this plant. So, um, it's, it's good to try not to disturb these plants until active management can be done because if they're seed bearing and they spread, you could have a really big problem on your hands uh, by multiple acres. And then this is the close-up of the hydrilla that I mentioned that's down in the Connecticut River in Mass in Connecticut. If you look at it, it looks a lot like our native elodea or water weed. And I've got to tell you, it's already looking like it's going to be a big water weed type of year. Um, native water weed is like a boomer bust plant. So it seems like every three years, native water weed is abundant. It's taller, it's covering more lake bottom area. So if you do see something that looks something like hydrilla, take a look at it and take it out of the water and count the leaves. If the leaves are in threes, it's a native. So three leaves whirled around the stem at every point where there's a whirl of leaves. If there are four or more leaves consistently up the stem, it could potentially be hydrilla or another invasive. So leaf count matters here. Um, again, we don't have hydrilla in New Hampshire. This is a photo from a plant from a lake in Maine. And the plant here is only, I think about six or eight inches tall. It looks a lot bigger because I blew it up here, but the plant does have the potential to get 25 feet tall, which is huge. So we, we definitely don't want to have this one come our way. Um, I can tell you the native water weed can get three feet tall. So if you start to see plants in your lake that look like this, that are three feet tall or so still, it's not necessarily a cause for panic, but it definitely bears a double check just to make sure that the leaves are in three and they're okay. Uh, and you probably are familiar with the little saying for uh, poison ivy, leaves of three, leave it be. For this plant, for the native plant, leaves of three is okay. Four or more is not. And I just highlighted a few of the really common plants that I really worry about in the state and that most of you should be aware of. If you want to see the whole list of plants, we have 29 species that are listed as prohibited in New Hampshire. And then there's that Hotonia plant that I mentioned at the beginning that you should also be familiar with. Uh, you are welcome to take a look at this link for the full 29 species that are of concern uh, and get familiar with those. And then I just wanted to touch on the animals and put those before you as a refresher going into the summer season. On the upper left is spiny water flea. We do not have this one in New Hampshire yet. We do have an active monitoring program for it. And many of you that have plankton samples taken from your VLAP lakes, uh, Sarah definitely would be keeping an eyeball out for those as she is doing your plankton counts. And then there are a couple of us, uh, other biologists, that do special studies to look for spiny water flea in our lakes and ponds, our bigger lakes and ponds especially, because um, spiny water fleas in Lake Champlain in Vermont and in Lake George in New York, and a lot of those boaters tend to come to our larger lakes in the state, and we're keeping an eye out for them there. Um, but you do have that safety net of your plankton samples being analyzed um, annually or almost annually for, for these. 
Um, then on the next side, uh, um, to the right of that, is the zebra mussel. Also not in New Hampshire yet, but it is in Massachusetts and Vermont, so it's on two of our borders. This one is about the size of a pistachio nut, and it is banded in some capacity, brown or white, black or white, tan or brown, um, something like that with stripes. And it's D-shaped, so it's got a flat side and the other side of the shell arcs out more of a D-shape. And it has these little sticky strands. So zebra mussels attach to hard surfaces. So you won't necessarily see these lying on your lake bottom, but you would probably see them attached to your boats or your buoys or your black pipes or rocks or anything hard underwater. So if you start to see little pistachio sized uh, muscles attached to things, that's something that we would like to know about. Uh, the Chinese mystery snail, many of you have this. We have it listed as an invasive in the state, but we haven't seen anything other than the kind of gross factor of how big they are. Uh, and we haven't really seen them affect lakes in any way yet um, from our data sets. But the Chinese mystery snail is one to look out for. Um, there's no active management unless you self actively manage and that would be through just hand picking these out of the lake and we recommend either putting them in the trash or putting them far away from water on land um, so that they can't get back into the water and uh, they are about the size of golf balls so they would be very noticeable you guys have lots of native snails in your lakes that you probably don't even notice because they're so tiny but these snails are very big so you would notice them if they were there uh, and then finally, the Asian clam on the bottom right. We do have this in a handful of water bodies in the state. It is in a couple lakes where, and be their VLAP lakes, where they are at about 100% cover across the bottom. So unlike the zebra mussel, the Asian clam isn't going to be stuck to things. It's actually going to be just on the bottom. And you might not see it on the bottom because it can dig itself in by as much as a few inches into the bottom sediment. So it could be there, but you might not know it. So if you have very sandy substrates in your lake, the VLAP program and the exotic species program both have typically, uh, Sarah has interns this summer, I do not this summer, but um, we do have interns in normal years where we could send them out to help you with um, some sieve uh, equipment to do some sam sampling of your sediment to see if they are in fact there. They do come up to the surface, so if you do see small clams on the lake bottom, it could be those. Uh, but I also want to warn that we do have a couple native clam species that are this little. Um, the difference is for the Asian clam, if you were to run your finger over the shell, you would feel very distinct ridges along the shell. The native clams that we have have uh, much smoother shells, so you wouldn't feel very distinct ridges. Uh, and just as a note, these guys are anywhere from about the size of a dime to about the size of a quarter for the really mature ones. So they do vary a little bit in size. Uh, the scary thing about the Asian clam is that it only takes the introduction of one, and that could be a larvae that matures to an adult or an adult that's introduced because the Asian clams have both male and female parts within one shell, and they can uh, one Asian clam can reproduce itself quite well. Um, other factors with all of these is that they do have the ability to um, form almost like daughter cells that don't necessarily need to be fertilized. So they could potentially uh, grow colonies of themselves without both male and female. Um, the spiny water flea is especially prone to that. So it is something that is good to be aware of. And then I just want to go through a few key approaches um, that we have, and I, I, I always refer to this as our mantra, and I'll go through the different pieces of that mantra. I do want to highlight the fact that we do have different invasive species programs in the state that it's good to be aware of. 
Um, so the Department of Environmental Services deals mostly with invasive aquatic plants. So the plants that are in your lakes that are of concern. So those would come to me. Uh, the Department of Agriculture deals with terrestrial invasive plants, and that does include um, plants that are right along the shoreline areas uh, as well, as long as they're not in the water. And then they also deal with insects. So that would be things like the hemlock woolly adelgid, the Asian longhorn beetle, things like that. So Doug Saigan is the contact for that program, and his email address is included here. And then anything dealing with fish or animals, uh, those fall under the purview of the Fish and Game Department. You can certainly still report invasive animals that grow in lakes to me, and I can certainly convey to Fish and Game. Uh, so just um, keep that in mind as well. But uh, there are several options here for different invasive species programs. So if you happen to be out and you see something that's on land, um, Doug would be your person. If it happens to be an animal in the lake, that would be fishing game. And then plants are me, but you can always reach out to me if you need to. So with the program as a whole, um, all the invasive species programs, both in New Hampshire as well as regionally and nationally, try to have multiple elements to their programs. And a lot of you have seen this because a lot of you participate in this. Um, and the mantra is prevention, early detection, rapid response, and long-term management. Um, so what that means is we try to prevent infestations as much as possible. Uh, we do a lot of things to try to do that, and I'll go through a couple of those. If we can't prevent them, we try to find them early, through early detection. And that allows us to respond very quickly and try to contain the infestation and then manage it to the point of hopefully eradication which is easier when infestations are new. Um, if we can't, then we move into a long-term management approach. So for prevention, on the state level, we have a lot of laws and rules that try to keep these things from moving between water bodies. We have prohibited species in the state, and some of them I just went through. We have um, laws that ban the sale, transport, introduction, propagation, um, uh, purchase of invasive species because a lot of these started in the home water garden trade or the aquarium trade. So we're trying to limit the overland spread of these things so they're not getting into water bodies. Uh, so laws and rules help do that. We have signage. Many of you have signs at your boat launches. If you need new signs, please let me know. I can get those to you. Uh, many of you participate in the Lake Coast program, doing courtesy boat inspections and uh, educating boaters about moving things. And it's especially thanks to the Lake Coast program that gets to these transient boaters who might not be affiliated with a group like a bass group or something that we can't directly get the message out to. So the Lake Coast have done a good job at educating all types of boaters about invasive species. Um, we are starting to ramp up programs where we'll have more boat washing and cleaning stations available in the state. And uh, many, many lakes have actually done like pull off spots or hoses or clean off sites uh, at their boat launches to try to help prevent invasive species. And some towns have even enacted ordinances where boaters are required to wash their boat at a car wash before they put it into a water body in town. Uh, or other ordinances related to invasives. So those are all different prevention activities that are out there. For early detection, uh, we have biologists that are out there doing surveys and many, many thanks to all of you VLAPers who are looking for invasives while you're out doing your VLAPing and in between when you're on the water body. Uh, and then we also have weed watchers who may or may not be VLAPers that are out looking as well. So lots of eyes on the water. Uh, for those of you who aren't part of the Weed Watcher program yet, we do encourage you to become a Weed Watcher. And uh, I'll go through a couple important pieces of that. But it's a really proactive way at helping to find new infestations early. And we've had volunteers who found single stems of plants that have settled and grown in their water bodies and they've caught it before it spread. Others have found little patches or clumps. Um, 
we're trying to get away from what happened in the past where nobody was really looking on a regular basis and then suddenly we'd find acres of growth. So it, it's a really good thing. Um, you don't need a lot of equipment. You just need something to get out on the water with. Um, anything listed here is good. You can scuba dive or snorkel um, as well if you want to swim it. Um, and then we have the outline maps and historic plant maps of your lakes on that DES lake mapper that I mentioned so that you can have a history of what was previously in your water body to go as a guide. Um, and then the weed watcher kits that we have have plant identification keys and information in them that help you to identify invasives. Um, and then we also recommend you guys have like a long handled rake or something that you could reach down and collect a specimen with in case you don't feel like jumping in the water and keep some Ziploc bags or jars or buckets with you when you're out on the water so you can collect specimens and bring them back for ID. And then one of the really useful things just to have on you at all times when you're on the water is a pair of polarized sunglasses. These are really useful in helping to cut the glare on the surface of the water so that you can see down in uh, a little bit better. And then when you're out weed watching, for those of you who are new to the program, we recommend breaking up the shoreline into sections so that we don't have one or two volunteers that feel compelled to survey the entire lake. But if you have teams of volunteers and you each take a small section and you survey that once a month from May through September, that should be sufficient to do an early detection on your water body if you do have something that's introduced. Uh, and the method is very simple. You just go out once a month from May through September and survey your section. And to do that, we recommend covering as much area from shore out to where you can't see bottom in your lake anymore. Uh, most invasive species typically grow from three to 10 feet deep in water bodies. But if you are on a lake that has an exceptional clarity where you've got 20 feet of clarity, you may have plants growing deeper than that. So you may have to go pretty far offshore in your surveys. And we recommend doing parallel transacts or zigzags back and forth from shore just to try to cover as much area as possible. And when you're out there, scan the surface and look for any floaters. And then also scan the bottom and look for any animals on the bottom or any rooted plants that look like they might be suspicious. And what are you looking for? Um, you're looking for anything that looks new or different. You guys are the experts on your water body. You monitor water quality for your water body and you recreate on your water body. And many of you have a good history on your water body. So you'll notice anything that's new or out of place. Does something look like it wasn't um, intended to be there? Was it introduced and it seems to be growing quickly? Is it very bright green? Is it very numerous? Um, anything like that is what you should be looking for. If you find something, we encourage you to try to mark it with some something. It could be a buoy that could be like a piece of a kitty noodle float or an old water bottle or a laundry detergent bottle, uh, just so that you can try to get back to that spot. You can also use GPS if you are tech savvy and take coordinates or put a waypoint down um, so that you can get back to that spot. Or you can triangulate between points on shore, flag the shoreline, uh, or just make some general notes about the portion of the water body where you are. That way, if, if you need to call me and I need to go find that spot, you've got some guidance where, where we should go and take a look. After you've marked the location, uh, we recommend collecting a voucher specimen. Unfortunately, I can't come out for a specimen ID uh, just because we just don't have that capacity. But if you were to collect a voucher specimen, you can send it to us by email, a photo by email or a live specimen by mail, and we can identify it. Another option is to send it in with your VLAP samples and Sarah will pass it along to me and I can take a look at it for you. Uh, if you do collect a voucher specimen, we ask that you place it on a piece of white paper or paper towel if you intend to send a picture of it. Um, arrange the leaves or flowers so that they can be seen clearly and put something, some object of known size. A uh, ruler is really good, but uh, anything you have, a pen, a pair of scissors, a, 
I'm looking around me, uh, a, a cup, anything like that would be useful. Uh, and then take a digital picture and email it to me. Um, or you can drop it off or send it into DES with my name on it. This allows us to um, take a look at the specimen and determine if it's something that we need to respond to quickly. If it's an invasive species, we'll let you know and we will be out rapidly. We will come out and uh, map the water body and take a look for where it is, what it is, how dense it is, and then we'll form a strategy for how to deal with it. Um, if it's a native, that's great. We'll just let you know by email or, or some other response that it's a native and it's not anything to worry about. But know that if you do find it invasive, we will be out quickly uh, and we will assess the situation and then figure out where to go from there. Uh, and this is a, an image of what some of our mapping looks like. All of our mapping is uh, done in GIS and this allows us to track growth over time or to annotate the maps for either diving, like these little red and white dive flags indicate, or treatment areas, or any other type of control. So this is what it would look like if we were to map your water body and um, then go to, to some type of management action. And management could be any one of these or a combination of them. We might contain or um, not necessarily quarantine, but, but close off an area of a water body to prevent further spread. We might physically control it by hand, it, hand picking it, um, capturing it if it's, an, if it's an animal, putting bottom barriers down. Um, if it's something that isn't fragment um, specific in terms of spread, we may mechanically harvest it like the water chestnut we might use chemical control for mostly plants. There is not a really good way to control animals yet uh, that's safe for fish and other aquatic life, but with herbicides, we can be pretty specific to the target plant. And then um, biological control. This doesn't really exist for a lot of plants right now, but it does work for purple loosestrife, and um, there could be a potential for biocontrol for purple loosestrife. Uh, if it is starting to get out of control. And all of our water bodies that are under active management have a long-term management plan created for them. Uh, and they use integrated pest management strategies. And what that means is that it involves a lot of monitoring, using a combination of the techniques that I just went through, assessing how that worked, and then reapplying anything that we need to in order to get those species under control. Uh, the troubling thing is we're dealing with natural systems and we're also dealing with an adaptive invasive species. So we call the type of management we do adaptive management because we're, we're adapting as we go sometimes in water bodies. So it takes a lot of work to manage infestations. That's why we put a lot of emphasis on prevention and early detection because long-term management is difficult and expensive. Uh, to that end, when it comes to invasive species, um, if you have a new infestation, the state will pay 100% of management for the first year, and then any follow-up management actions are um, a cost match between local and state dollars. So we recommend establishing a local trust fund if you don't already have one, and that can be started by either a warrant article or a budget line item on the town budget or with a lake association putting funding into a special account. And we recommend that that is a non-lapsing account and continually appropriated. So it's there when you need it locally. Uh, and it's helpful to, to dig into if you do find yourself with an infestation. Many towns across the state actually allocate resources towards invasive species, as do lake associations. So that is the slideshow refresher. I'm gonna pop open the question box and see if we have any questions yet. And it looks like we have some. All right, so I'm just gonna go through and um, I'll read the question so you guys can see the question and then I'll answer the questions. Um, so Charlie Madsen, Marsden asks, we see state grants for the invasive species of plants. However, we're seeing a rapid growth of non-invasive plants that we are choke that's choking our water bodies. 
these plants impact um, lake recreation, swimming, boating, and fishing. How can we control this rapid weed plant growth? Um, so native plants are something that are protected in New Hampshire. So the Natural Heritage Bureau that I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the um, Hotonia plant, they actually protect um, natives and they don't want natives managed. So there are laws that relate to native plant management. And for that reason, we don't grant state dollars for native plant management. Now, with that said, you certainly could elect to do some type of native plant management, uh, but that would be wholly funded locally. So the Lake Association or a group of shoreline residents or the town would need to pay for native plant management. It's not something the state would do. We don't deem native plants a problem in lakes. Um, and I know that's very subjective, but from a biological standpoint, native plants are favored. Uh, the next question is from Courtney Moore, and she says, I noticed a white bloomed flower on Pine Island Pond this weekend. You may want someone to stop by and look at the perimeter road side of the pond. Um, okay, yeah, I'll take a look at that. Or Courtney, the next time you're out, if you could take a, a photo and email that to me, that would be great. I was on Pine Island Pond about three weeks ago and I didn't see anything that was of concern, but if you would like to get that to me, that would be great. Um, and then John Mullen asks, uh, why are most, if not all aquatic invasive species <laughs> south of Concord, uh, none up in the Northern lakes? So yeah, if you guys remember the map I showed you, it's pretty much the southern half of the state, basically from the lakes region south that were impacted. Uh, and we don't know why. We get a lot of boaters at lakes across the northern half of the state, but invasive species just haven't settled there yet. Uh, we're looking for them, but luckily we haven't found them. Uh, I think that a lot of our lakes in the southern half of the state just receive a lot more boat traffic regularly and the risk is higher. But with that said, both Maine and Vermont do have northern water bodies that have invasive species in them. We just haven't seen them at New Hampshire yet. So I don't really have an, a great answer for that. I'm glad they're not affected, but um, I, I think it's only a matter of time. And then Claude Lemoy asks, um, is this the same presentation that DES will offer this Wednesday evening? So uh, I'm offering a presentation to the Lake Sunapee Association on Wednesday night, and there will be some crossover content, but the information is gonna be more specific to the Sunapee area. Um, you may see some repeat slides, but uh, this was more general, and I'm gonna be talking more specifically about Sunapee and surrounding uh, water bodies Wednesday. Uh, so I don't see any other questions that have come in. I'll give you guys um, a couple more seconds, a couple more minutes to chime in with questions. We've got, I've got two to eight right now. So if you want your fingers to type in a question, you've got a couple minutes to do that. All right. I am not seeing anything else come in. Um, so like, Sa oh, like Sarah said, uh, this has been recorded and if this will process and then she'll get it up on the website as soon as um, the processing is done. It does take a little bit to process the recorded video. So uh, thank you again for joining us and feel free anytime you see anything weird or suspicious or potentially menacing in your water bodies, feel free to send it along to me uh, and I'll take a look at it. Um, if you see anything really cool that you know is normal, feel free to send that too. I always like to take a look at what you guys find. So I wish you a very nice summer and I hope you don't find anything bad in your water bodies. Take care everyone. <laughs>